Uh, it is so wonderful to see all of you here today on this Thursday afternoon for our very exciting green quarantine session, all about sustainable sourcing for costumes and clothing. Uh, and we have an incredible expert panel here uh, that will answer all of your questions and let us all know um, how to make great choices. Uh, however, to get us started, a little bit about the BGA. Uh, so I'm Molly Braverman, she, her, and I am the director of the Broadway Green Alliance. And we have a mission to educate, motivate, and inspire the entire theater community and its patrons to adopt environmentally friendlier practices. And that is exactly what we will be working on here all together today. Um, so please, as the session goes, feel free to put questions in the chat and we will have a nice long Q&A section at the end. Uh, if you're comfortable, I will be asking you to uh, hop on and ask your question verbally and we'll have an opportunity for that as well. If you need closed captioning, it is available on the upper left of your screen. You'll see live on Otter AI notes. Feel free to access that. And please reach out to either me or our wonderful assistant director, Chrissy Lineker, uh, if you have any other access needs we can help you with throughout this session. So otherwise, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. Um, so starting with Kristen Ahren, uh, who is going to be moderating our panel for us uh, this afternoon. Welcome, Kristen. And on our panel, we have Eileen Clancy, Lauren Gaston, Ashley Prezwicki, apologies, Jessica Schreiber, and Nan Zabriski. Uh, so it is an honor to have all of you here, and I will now turn it over to Kristen to lead us in. Thank you so much, Molly. Really excited to be here. Uh, as Molly said, I am Kristen. I am a freelance costume designer and the founder of Conscious Costume, which serves to create discussion and resources for costume professionals who are trying to have a more ethical practice. Um, so I'm just going to go around and let everyone do their intros. Um, I, I am in uh, Chicago, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, so I'll just call on our panelists one by one to do their intros, and then we'll get into a structured question section. So uh, Nan, do you want to start? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Great, there we go. Hi, nice to see everybody here. Nice to see Susan and. Charlie and Ben and some people I don't know. Um, I'm Nan Zabriski. I was freelance costume design. Well, I still am in Chicago. I headed the makeup and wig program at DePaul University for 40 years. And I am the founder of Chicago Green Theater Alliance. She, her. Fabulous. Uh, Eileen. Hi, everybody. I'm Eileen Clancy, and I am the assistant costume shop manager at the Goodman Theater. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, Lauren? Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I'm a freelance costume designer and maker. My pronouns are she, hers. Calling in from Astoria, Queens today, and I'm also one of the co-authors of the Sustainable Production Toolkit, along with Edward Morris, who I also see on the call today. Uh, Ashlyn? Hello, everyone. My name is Ashlyn Prezdwicki. I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from Minneapolis. Um, I am the Director of Operations and Community for Fashion Revolution USA. We're a global campaign calling for a clean, safe, uh, and transparent and accountable fashion industry. We provide uh, open source resources and tools for anyone uh, from citizens to designers, business leaders, brands, retailers to engage in systematic changes for uh, a fashion industry that prioritizes people and the planet. Wonderful. And then Jessica. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Schreiber. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm joining today from Brooklyn, New York, actually from the back office of the FabScrap warehouse. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of FabScrap, which works with about 500 fashion companies to collect all of the excess or unwanted raw materials, fabric, leathers, feathers, trims, buttons, zippers, and make them available to makers, um, students, shoppers, and artists. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, so much. Um, so we're going to kick off the structured questions session. Uh, panelists, if you want to chime in and it's not technically your question, please feel free to, to answer and add on uh, the, the 
person designated for the questions just so we have somewhere to start the conversation. Um, so the first question I'm going to throw to Ashlyn, uh, how can consumers be make more responsible choices when buying clothing? I think that's everyone's kind of biggest question is how to start. Yeah, absolutely. We get that question all the time. Um, and people always ask, what brands can I shop? Like when you first start learning about sustainability or ethics and some of the issues in the fashion and textile industry, um, the first question is always, well, where can I shop? And we always try to encourage individuals to think about the concept of uh, very similar to reduce, reuse, recycle, like going back to the first step of reducing, um, starting with thinking about um, using what you have, looking at what you already have, um, can you borrow it, can you swap, can you buy it secondhand, um, and so really looking at the concept of like the hierarchy of needs, which is very similar uh, to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So really just starting with, the, with that basic of what do you already have? Where else can you get it? Um, can you make it? And then finally, if you, if you absolutely need to buy it, um, really pausing and thinking about, do I need this? Will I wear it 30 times? What will happen to it after I'm done with it? Will it just end up in a landfill? Is it a high quality piece? So really just pausing and thinking and slowing down it, your buying process is a really great place to start. Um, and then of course, as you start doing research uh, when you're buying something, it can get really overwhelming. There's a lot of things going on with sustainability and ethics, and there's no company that's doing everything perfectly. Um, and I'm sure as we all think about our own sustainability journeys, there's no way to do it exactly right. Um, so really just understanding your own fashion values. Um, so whether or not you care a lot about, you know, women's rights and equality, thinking about how you can incorporate that into your buying. Do you care a lot about environmental practices? Can you incorporate you know, more plastic free into your buying or looking at how something was produced or made? And so there's a, there's a lot of ways to get started and it really just aligns with who you are, what your values are and just really doing your research. Um, and if you don't know, you can just ask a company. Um, I think there's a lot out there that um, that people, you know, want to be more transparent. They want to share more, and you have a lot of buying power. And I really love um, the idea of switching the word consumer to the word citizen. So how do we like think about our buying more as an active use of our values and not just us as consumers, but us as active citizens using our buying power in our wallets to change the industry. So we do a lot of that um, kind of conversation and hope that everyone will start thinking about how they do that, whether it's in their work or in their personal life. Um, so that's sort of what we, where we help people get started. I think that's great. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've been trying to um, also talk about is that there's a lot of different ways to be a conscious costumer. Um, you know, I, especially in 2020 um, with the We See You White American Theater document, which calls for auditing, purchasing, um, you know, thinking about black owned businesses as mm -hmm. another way to be uh, a conscious consumer or a conscious citizen, as you say. So thank you so much. Um, so I know uh, one of the things that a lot of people ask about when they are purchasing new is some of the um, is some of the brands, like you said, but also uh, certifications and and some of those um, key you know symbols or words that you can look for when you are searching. Um, so uh, Lauren, I know that you've done a lot of research into certifications to make sure that we're buying uh, truly responsibly made products. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to some of those uh, terms to search for as you're buying. Sure, happy to. Um, just to reiterate to what Ashlyn was saying, definitely a good place to start is um, you know, buying used, asking yourself, do I really need this? Um, and that's certainly where I start as a costume designer too, you know, looking in, in costume stocks, looking to swap with my fellow designers, um, looking to see what's vintage. And then I've started 
researching into certifications, both um, from a design standpoint, but also as um, as a concerned citizen, or um, I think the founder of the menswear brave gentleman calls it um, as a citizen investor. How can we, you know, spend our money in a way that's um, socially and environmentally responsible? And one of those ways is to look for certifications. Um, there is no, you know, perfect, in my opinion, certification. There's no, um, you know, there's certainly gold standards, but I think I, I encourage all of you to read, research, ask questions uh, as you're looking into these things. Some of the certifications um, like fair trade cover social issues, working environment, agriculture, environmental impact. There's also the uh, Global Organic Textile Standard, OCOTEX certification. Um, I, I've been reading most recently on um, the Rainforest Alliance certification. And a lot of these um, certifications have, you can go to their, their website and look for brands or companies um, that have the certification on their site. There's often a directory. Uh, you can also look um, I believe you can also look at your tag and your clothing. Some, you know, look for fair trade, um, look for GOTS or OCOTEX um, as a way to to see um, what kind of, you know, to see if that was produced in a way meeting rigorous environmental and uh, social standards. But um, as the Rainforest Alliance uh, points out, a uh, the success of a certification of anything that's measuring impact um, is only as successful as um, the training, capacity building, education that's poured into the community that's making the product. Um, so that's something that the Rainforest Alliance has done a really um, you know, deep investigation of and what kind of long-term investment uh, within that kind of um, with that kind of structure, a really community-centered focus, because I think um, you know, one of the big questions I ask myself is how can we create a regen, not just, um, you know, a regenerative design and production process, but regenerative communities. Like how can we, um, as designers of our own, you know, our own communities and um, networks kind of adopt that, that mindset. So it's a really long winded way of saying <laughs> what's there some certifications to search for, but I, I look forward to hearing from uh, the other panelists, too, in terms of what other insight they might have on that. Yeah, does anyone else uh, want to add some other certifications that are out there? Okay, cool. I'd oh. be happy to pop in, um, yeah. and I'll pop them in the chat. So Fashion Revolution does a transparency index report every year, uh, similar to Greenpeace, where they audit brands on transparency from human rights to um, ethical and sustainable standards. There's also a couple directories of um, approved fashion brands. And one um, tool that I really love is called the Good On You app. And they do a lot of that research for you. And a really neat thing that they have um, is you can put a web browser um, extension where um, when you're searching online for something, if they have an ethical alternative, it will pop up on your, your right-hand browser and let you know an alternative site that you can look for that's been approved for a product that you're searching. So like if you're on Amazon or somewhere looking for something, it will pop up and say like, hey, check out this fair trade company that might have this same product that's ethically sourced. And so there's a lot of tools like this popping up um, that kind of just help you uh, start to just shift your lifestyle to just looking at other alternative spaces. That's awesome. That's such a good tip. I didn't know about the extension. I knew about the app. So that's so cool. Um, well, great. Um, so, so far we've kind of been talking about uh, garments and, and the fashion side of things. Of course, some of the certifications also apply to our next question, which is um, fabric. Um, so I'm gonna go to our, our fabric uh, expert here, Jessica, um, about more conscious or sustainable ways to source fabric. And I think she also mentioned when we were chatting by email, free ways to source fabric. So I think that'll also be exciting for a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. Um... So I appreciate the fabric expert um, title that you said, though I don't quite feel qualified. Um, my background is waste management. And so most of what I've learned about textiles is 
about their end of life and their impact there. Um, and so I think there's like a couple things to consider when thinking through fiber choices. Um, obviously, if there's a very specific performance issue, some of these things are kind of non-negotiable, but end of life spandex really is like the biggest contaminant in all textile recycling. So anytime that you can avoid spandex is great. Um, most textile recycling now is just grinding the fabric down into like a low grade fiber pulp called shoddy. And shoddy is used in insulation, um, mattress stuffing, carpet padding, but we can't shred spandex. Um, it melts in the shredding process. And so if you can avoid spandex, it does mean that there's some end of life options for that fabric. Um, furthermore, I think where you can, choosing a natural fiber, um, cotton, wool, silk, um, those things should biodegrade um, when they eventually make their way to landfill as opposed to synthetic fibers, which are really at their core just a, another form of plastic. Um, which will never biodegrade and become smaller and smaller pieces that eventually enter our waterways. Um, I just want to like caveat all of this. This is end of life. The hardest thing about fiber choice is that if you're looking um, from source, sometimes an organic cotton uses so much more water than a conventional cotton. And so really it's not always an easy answer. I think um, like what was said before, determining what your core values are, if that is something that is easy on the planet when it's being sourced and formed and used. I think that there's lots of options for that. And if it's wanting to reduce waste at end of life, then there's definitely some clear choices there. Um, but those would be my main fiber tips. Um, just avoid spandex where you can and try to go natural. That's awesome. And I, I noticed the other day when I was looking at Fab Scraps uh, website that you guys are now selling the shoddy. Um, yes. So, so oh, the <clears throat> the free fabric part of your question. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, so, what Fab Scrap does is work with brands to collect all of the excess materials so that they don't have to landfill them, or in a lot of cases, they were being incinerated. So, instead, we collect them um, anonymously, redistribute them, so we never point back to the source of the brand, and that allows them to give us much more material. So, it's really high quality, sometimes low quantities. Um, volunteering at Fab Scrap earns you five free pounds of fabric. Um, for small pieces, it's pay what you wish. So if you would like some free spandex scraps, you can take as much as you want. Um, and yes, we do now have shoddy available and people use it to stuff pillows, stuff animals, stuff ottomans. Um, so maybe for like set design or something like that, it's a good option. Or for insulation, some people use it for soundproofing. So for shape padding for those of us in costumes who have to create uh, sh enhanced shapewear for our performers. Um, well, thank you so much. That's really fabulous. Um, and I think one thing that we've sort of touched on is sort of how hard it is to, to make the, the right choice. And I think one um, gremlin that always exists out there is, is greenwashing, that there are a lot of brands out there that are taking conventional things and packaging them in craft paper instead of packaging them in, in white paper, and all of a sudden it looks more sustainable. Um, so uh, how can consumers sort of see beyond that and make ethical choices uh, or be more active in products brands are producing? Um, and I'm going to throw this to Ashlyn first, but if other people have insight, that would be great. Yeah, I would love to hear uh, from everyone because greenwashing is one of the biggest challenges I think even I face as I'm researching and looking through and I feel like I've been in and around this conversation for such a long time. So don't feel bad or guilty. Um, this isn't all on the citizen. Um, it's really on the brands and uh, the people on the producing side to be um, transparent and accountable. And so um, when I really think about greenwashing and sort of like what I look at, I think importance is like on prioritizing local and supporting small independent brands first. Um, you can really just see their transparency um, a little bit more. Their um, like the, the size of their production is smaller, so their impact is automatically smaller. Um, and I think you can just like engage with smaller independent um, brands and businesses first. Um, and then I think a lot about transparency. When you're doing your research, how transparent is their website? 
what types of claims are they making, how big are the claims, um, are they clear about what they're focused on and what they're not. Um, one of my favorite things to see in a brand is how open and honest they are about their process or their progress um, over like claiming to be perfect and grand because there's no way that a company is going to be perfect. But if they're open and honest about you know, like a Patagonia, for example, that's a, a great example of like a North Star of uh, transparency is that they recognize that they're not doing everything perfectly, but they're open about what they are doing well and what they're not and what they're working on. So I think trusting your gut for authenticity is really important. Um, and then really challenging those large corporations to do better. So the ones that are producing on such mass, you know, quantities, how holistic is their commitment to sustainability? Are they making these big major sweeping claims about how recyclable their plastic bottles are? Like that, that in this day and age is pretty basic at this point. And so looking at what's the large claim and then what's the fine print. And if you kind of see um, that there's a gap in that, I, I would kind of follow that and question it a little bit more. Um, and challenging words like natural, sustainable, eco-friendly, recycled versus recyclable, like educating ourselves on the definitions of those things because they really don't mean anything. Um, and so like what are those certifications or, or just what are the transparencies that, um, that these companies have on their websites and on their tags? And then when you think about um, like the ethics side of things, are they talking about their supply chain at all? Are they recognizing who makes their textiles or their clothing? Are they paid a living wage versus a minimum wage? And I think there's just some questions to start getting familiar with as you're doing research. Um, and I'm happy to share some links on some like ways you can get more personally um, equipped with um, asking things about companies and brands um, and just really feeling confident about navigating that space. But I'm excited to hear what others, how, how you audit or look at different companies in your research. And share a little bit, um, just because FabScrap has partnerships with so many different brands now. Um, both fashion and interior design brands. Um, and what's interesting is we let brands choose whether or not we share their logo publicly. And um, I thought every brand would want to, like they're doing this great internal thing to reduce and measure their waste. Um, but it's 50-50 brands who will share our partnership publicly and brands who prefer to remain anonymous. Um, I'm choosing the like optimistic view of that, which is that there are a lot of companies who are taking internal steps and have no way to talk about it to the public yet. They don't know how to frame it. They are not sure how customers are gonna question it or respond to it. So the good news is that I do think brands are starting because of customer pressure to like take notice, also because of their own employees wanting to see their companies that they work at do these things. And so I think, um, Ashlyn, like you said, encouraging companies to feel more comfortable talking about their steps and knowing that it's okay to be taking steps and not be at 100 before you say something. Um, because I do think companies are in a little bit of limbo where they're both afraid <laughs> to share. Um, and they also have this, I see, I see this two ways. They are afraid of consumers who know so much that they're gonna question every little thing and kind of like criticize steps that they don't feel go far enough. They also feel like consumers don't care and all they care about is price. And so I think really consumers are more in the middle and the more that brands know that we just want to see information, we want to see where the alignment is with our values. Um, it really is empowering for them to start to talk more openly about what they're doing. I have just a little minute on that. Um, years ago, well, God, how long ago was it that Newsweek did their top 500 uh, greenest companies. It was like 10 years ago or something. But um, there was a really interesting study with Nike that actually was doing a lot of things that helped. They designed an apparel design program that was had designers choose what they were going to make the shoe out of. 
by right from the beginning, which is something I think we as theater designers don't do enough of often, that we say, oh, before I just design whatever I please, let me consider the materials and pick the greenest one. But they wouldn't, you, you mentioned Patagonia, Jessica, and unlike how Patagonia is 1% for the planet and very transparent about what they're doing in their recycling efforts, Nike was sort of putting theirs undercover because it didn't fit with their image of themselves and their customers to have a hemp shoe, for instance, which they did, they produced a hemp shoe. So I think, you know, we're making progress on that, but I think there's definitely some companies who don't want to be seen as that as part of their image, which thankfully is changing. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that's a lot of really different ways of looking at it. Because one of the things that I was thinking while Ashlyn was talking is usually if I'm on a brand and they aren't shouting about how sustainable they're being, I assume that they're not doing enough or they're not doing anything. But um, yeah, that is true. There's a lot of brands out there that sort of are more concerned about their image in other ways. So that's, that's a really mm -hmm. interesting perspective. Thank you, uh, Nan and Jessica, for that. Um, so I want to sort of switch gears a little bit and and turn the the mic over to Eileen Clancy, who is the assistant costume shop manager at the Goodman here in Chicago, and um, talk about sort of what things are like on the the large shop level. Um, so Eileen, I wonder if you could share some success stories or challenges uh, since you do a lot of sourcing in um, in what the, your costume shop has encountered, and then um, open the floor to our other panelists. Um, for feedback of on on some of those challenges. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a success story first because I think that those are always fun. Um, we did a show called Venus and Fur, and as the name you know as the title suggests, there was fur in the in the actual making of the costumes. Um, we had three actual pieces that we needed. We had a coat that we were able to pull from stock and use as was, um, and use as is. And then um, we needed to do a five yard hem. So of course, in order to color match, you're gonna go with a real fur, but we chose fake. So we bought from New York Elegance uh, and bought a big piece of uh, faux fur. And then um, we needed a neck piece. And so we looked at Etsy because we didn't want to create any new manufacturing of fur. We wanted to go with something that already existed. Um, and we were able to find a really great piece uh, in the color that we needed, and we just reshaped it to be what we needed it to be. So um, for me, I think that's a success story because we didn't actually um, participate in creating any new fur manufacturing. Um, or, um, and, we, and the kind of really cool part about it is taking those beautiful old furs and giving them a second chance, you know, or third chance or fourth, depending on how many times it's been used. So I think that that's kind of really great. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we face in the theater is time. In a regional theater, you have three to four weeks to build a show. Sometimes you know enough uh, in advance to do some kind of responsible shopping, but that's not usually the case because you're usually back to back to back to back on shows. Um, so that and cost are always our biggest, biggest challenges. Um, Sourcing locally is very hard. Uh, we know that the fabric stores are starting to close down. We just heard that Vogue is um, going to be closing its doors due to the pandemic. They've, uh, they downsized once to one store and now they're downsizing completely. And I, I don't know whether or not they're, re they're going to be reopening or if they do, it's gonna be on a much smaller level. Um, we have a couple other stores locally that we really like to use, Yarnify and um, uh, Sutash, they're very small little independent stores um, for notions and yarns. Uh, we're not quite sure how they're going to weather this pandemic. I haven't heard whether or not either of them are still open or if they have closed, but um, our, our sources are dwindling and I think that that is another really big challenge. Um, so when we're looking at procuring for the theater, we're looking at first speed, then we're looking at cost, um, we're looking at does this company do returns? We're looking at does this company have different shipping options because we may be able to take some things on a slow boat or we may honestly just have to do it as quickly as possible because the fitting's tomorrow. We don't really always get that option. Um, and that kind of takes us into like the bigger box stores, right? So then we're shopping at a place like Amazon because they have a lot of the things that we need, right? So you can shop for notions, fabrics, dresses, pants, undergarments, shoes, I mean, you name it, they've got it, right? So um, they also have some really good things that they have. They've got prime shipping, so we're not paying for shipping. 
They've got return policies, which are always really great for us. Um, they do have all the different shipping options that we need. And relatively, they're pretty cost comparison, like comparison wise, they're pretty much on the same level as all the other places that we're shopping at. So in that sense, we're not really giving a lot up. So for all of its great qualities, are we really shopping ethically? You know, like, and that's the hard part, right? Because we're giving up some of the things that we find to be really um, within ourselves, our own, our own moral compass, right? So it's hard shopping at places like that, but they give us so much that it's hard, it's hard to do, um, it's hard to not shop at them, right? So I think that those are like, you know, the success stories are awesome and you always feel really good about those. And then you have the other hand, right? Where it doesn't balance your life out knowing that you have to shop at these big box stores or that you can't find something locally and now you're shopping somewhere else. Um, and now, you know, given the environment that we're in, we're also looking at BIPOC, you know, so not only locally, but BIPOC and, and it's just, it's taking on a bigger connotation. So you've got green, you've got ethical, you've got BIPOC. You've, so um, it, it's getting a little bit uh, tougher in the time frame that we have in order to shop and be mindful at all times of how we're shopping. So I think, I think that's, it's hard to think about, right? Because you're, you're, you you're don't want to, you don't want to give in. But at the same time, you need that pair of shoes. This company has them. So does Nike. But, you know, Amazon's going to give it to us in a day and a half and Nike's going to take a week and a half. So that's the give and take, right? Buy from the company itself and wait for it and possibly not have it or it doesn't work or there's no return policy or go with a store like Amazon where you can get those things. It's yeah. a, a catch-22. Can, can I just Jessica, quickly, go ahead. yeah, I just want to offer, this is not in any way to like absolve Amazon of, of like now all of a sudden it's okay, but um, sometimes when you just need things in a pinch, um, it's there. And instead of shopping amazon.com, if you can shop smile.amazon.com, they donate 0.5% of every purchase to a charity of your choice. So Fab Scrap is on there. You can choose um, a charity that supports um, any cause really that is important to you. And it does mean that Amazon is giving some of that <laughs> power back to organizations. And so I, I, I understand the struggle. And so that's one thing that even like Fab Scrap when we need stuff immediately makes us feel a little bit better because we're obviously our own Amazon Smile Choice charity. So we're getting a little bit back as a donation from Amazon. And there's so many different charities to choose from. And so that, that might help a little bit. We just learned about that. I just came up at a meeting yesterday, honestly. So I, <laughs> something that was very new to us, we had no idea. But then Can I just say one tiny thing? I think that, um, when we're talking about design and whether it comes from Amazon and how fast and whether we can find it locally, I think um, part of it has to come down to how we think about the design in the first place, at what point decisions are made. So even though we want 17 pairs of shoes in that fitting, so we're covered between the problematic sizes and the style choices, do you really have to do that? You know, do you have to have that frock coat made when there is something in storage that would work? And, you know, the answer we know, we're theater professionals in the, or fashion professionals, and the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. But I think that falls into the famous Alan Hershkowitz saying, better not best. But um, Danielle Worley had done a work, wonderful workshop with us, you know, talking about that very issue that related to how set models are built. You know, and part of it is uh, getting producers to look at a model built out of cord cardboard instead of foam core and saying, I get the essence of the design and it doesn't have to be sexy. So I think choices like that made all the way down the line that we get our producers used to maybe less choice. Um, as designers, we make more choices and use what's more easily available. So that's my two cents. I think that's a really great point. There's a, um, I just want to shout out, there's an interesting follow-up question from Edward on this. Uh, Edward, do you want to ask? Um, I was just curious, if I can read my question, uh, your decision to go with a fake fur, did that come from you, from the designer, the director? Uh, does Goodman have any company-wide goals around sustainability? 
That's a really good question. Um, the decision to go with the fake fur actually came from a combination of our director, or our actual our designer, our designer, um, and our costume shop manager. They had a discussion together about, um, you know, what would be best. And knowing that we had such a specific color palette that she was looking for, um, that the fake fur was honestly our best bet. Um, for me personally, I'm always looking for those 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 wiser choices those better, you know, better ways to go about it. Um, the Goodman is also very fortunate. We've been blessed with a lot of fur donations. I can't tell you how many people in Chicago donate their fur coats. Um, it's, it's unreal how many furs we have in stock that we're able to choose from. So knowing that we could choose from the coats that we already had, an Etsy coat where we didn't create any new waste, um, and then the fur, the faux fur from New York Elegant. It really came down to uh, design and the designer herself not wanting to create that kind of waste, which was really great. Um, the Goodman as a whole, I'm not actually able to speak to that. Um, I'm not at that upper echelon level where I have that, I'm privy to that information. I know that there are a lot of really good um, green initiatives that we are doing um, or trying to do. Um, and uh, I think we're all ultimately, after this pandemic, we've had a lot of time to think, right? And we maybe we can all move forward towards that. But as a whole, the Goodman does not have um, any kind of uh, stance on sustainability at this point. Um, so I wanna to touch on something that we've sort of uh, hit on a couple times, first with the biarchy of needs and then with Eileen pulling the fur coat from stock that a really great solution to environmentally conscious uh, costume design or production is um, pulling what you already have or fostering a really strong sharing network in your community. Um, and so I'd love for Nan to talk a little bit about the textile drive that the Chicago Green Theater Alliance does every year. And I think the Broadway Green Alliance does a textile drive as well. Is that correct, Molly? Um, and, and sort of how this helps with that goal. Uh, so Nan. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I first have to say that we founded, I founded Chicago Green Theater Alliance in 2014. And basically we said, why reinvent the wheel when Broadway Green Alliance had done such a fabulous job with toolkits and everything else. And what did we see? They did a textile drive in Times Square every year. So we thought we better do that. And an e-waste drive. So it's just copycat technique. Um, but we had to develop it on our own. Um, given Chicago groups and needs. So the first year, we, we actually did uh, an e-waste drive the first year. And this was great. We, we didn't have any money to pay for any of the hauling of all of this. So we found a nonprofit group called Avenues to Independence that would take and pick up all our e-waste and then they would in turn fix it and sell it. So they were providing jobs for their people. We didn't have to pay and 2.5 tons of e-waste left Chicago theaters um, in two days. Uh, it was amazing. People had room to put hammocks in their offices, which they hadn't seen for years because they were full of old computer parts. So then the next year we said, well, let's do a textile drive. And that was back when um, this talks in a little bit, I think it was Jessica talking about fabrics and, um, recycling them and we used to be able to have Chicago textile recycling who would gut all of the stuff and send it to various places and then of course when Africa started saying no more waste from you guys um, we had the the market fell out of recycling fabric scraps so what we found that um, I had a twofold goal in mind for that and one was to get as much of it reused by the theaters around as we could before it went to recycling. So Steppenwolf uh, Theater is located in a very easy place to get to for most theaters in Chicago. And what we wanted was to establish a drive that would happen, for instance, every May, and we're actually ready to go to two until COVID hit. Um, and so theaters would begin to know that, oh, come May, I can call my wardrobe. And so mainly the bigger theaters who had more to call would bring stuff, but small theaters brought stuff too. And then we would set it all up in this giant um, parking garage, uh, the second space at Steppenwolf. And we would open it up to designers and um, young designers who would get their whole shows by stuff that was brought by other theaters. And it really started working. We did it for six years um, and we I know plan to continue it. 
Um, but the exciting part was to see more and more go out every year. So we were ending up recycling less because people would know, oh, if I wait till May, I can get X, Y, and Z. Uh, one of the problems we found was that a lot of small theaters didn't have a lot of storage, so they couldn't grab a lot of stuff. But they could grab stuff for the next show or the next show after that. And it's, it's turned out to be a pretty exciting thing. And um, uh, the production manager at Timeline Theater, Maggie, has really taken it into a multi-day event where we bring in fab, we bring in scrappers and gizmologists that fix things and um, theaters and battery recyclers, and it's become pretty comprehensive. So um, it's been good. That's Thank great. you, BGA. <laughs> And, uh, and now Conscious Costume, uh, my organization has started a rentals facility here in Chicago. So the, the excess costume pieces don't actually go to a thrift store or a waste thing. They, they come to me. So if you see something there that you wanted and you didn't grab, um, I probably have it now. Oh, um, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So that's, that's only been true for the last year or so. Um, yeah. so. It was really only true for three months of functioning theater. So that's, but mm. we'll be back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I just want to touch on one more thing before we open up for the Q&A because ethical costumes is such a broad topic and we're mostly focused today on, on sourcing, um, but there's also things like dyeing and distressing and laundry and makeup and hair that are, could be their own panels, but Nan, I know you have a lot of resources that you're really excited about, so I wonder if you could spend just a moment talking about those sure. things um, before we open it up to the full Q&A. Sure. Um well, I, I ran the makeup and wig department at DePaul for 39 years, as I said, and I, I had little tiny victories, like we never bought a sponge. We would go to fabric stores and buy the foam that they used to cut cushions, and we bought the excess scrap, and we took it down to the bandsaw and cut it into 30, 60, 90 sponges, so they were, you know, they were easy to throw away, they didn't use new latex sponges, and uh, you know I'd always have my students compare them to latex sponges and they got to like them even more. So little tips like that, we never bought a container for water or anything, we brought in yogurt containers or whatever we were using at home. So things like that are good. Um, I actually worked with Eileen at the Goodman, I did a lot of makeup work for them, and um, one of my fanaticisms is baby wipes used inappropriately. They come in plastic, they have too many chemicals, and um, you throw them away. You throw everything about it away. Now, I'm the first to admit there are times in a quick change where you can bury a baby wipe in your pocket and you maybe can't bury something else. But I think mainly in makeup, what I was seeing way too much of is people using those instead of good old-fashioned break it down with cold cream and you know, wipe it off and use a, a, a wash rag and soap and water to clean up afterwards. So Goodman uh, started doing that with me and I think Eileen and I are sort of proud of that. Um, what I wanted to tell you though was some stuff from Mary Ellen Parks who is the crafter dyer painter for the Chicago Fire franchise in Chicago, which is an NBC thing. And she said, um, Whenever possible, I use dish detergent or baking soda to spot clean costumes rather than any harsh chemicals. So sandpaper, alcohol to deglaze things instead of really strong chemicals. Um, I, I think we're posting this online so you can read it all, but there were some really interesting things. I think um, <clears throat> many of us are from the era where we dipped our hands into Celastic and acetone without gloves and did all that stuff which horrifies us now and um, I think there are so many good alternatives and another person I looked at was Laura Whitlock who does uh, a lot of millinery work in Chicago and also costume crafts and aging and dying for film and television and uh, I think her biggest thing that I was excited about was use, not using lacquer-based sizing at all. She has found a product uh, that is PVA sizing, and PVA sizing is non-toxic and water-soluble, and this is something that the various laundry companies, True Earth and Sheets and Meliora, are all doing, which is so intuitive. It's like, we're eliminating the plastic bottles. Why are we shipping water all over the country when we all have some sort of water? So, and, and we're doing it in big plastic jugs, you know. 
So I think the fact that a lot of these places are shipping it in powder form that you rehydrate, um, it's just so much more um, efficient to do that. And it's a combination that we haven't talked about a lot because it's such a big topic, which is the health of the world in doing these products also comes directly back to the health of the artist using them. And so we're not using the toxic chemicals, we're not using um, crystalline mixtures and, and um, lacquer based sizing and TSP and all those products. Um, her favorite costume craft, this is Laura's favorite costume craft, is um, Warbla. And I'm sure many of you know about Warbla, it's a German company. And the thing about it is, I mean, thermoplastics are definitely a way to go rather than Celastic or some of those evil products because thermoplastic will rebond to itself. So you can keep using the scraps over and over. So those are just a tiny couple little tips and we are posting some of this on there. Great, uh, Molly, I know that you have been sort of monitoring the chat for questions. So I'd love to open it up to some questions and answers for these last few minutes. Absolutely, we have some great questions. I'm gonna go all the way back and uh, start with Stephanie Fisher, if you have wanna follow up on your question about labor. Hi, yeah, sorry, I'm multitasking. Um, I'm curious about um, if there's any way to find out about ethical practices with making the fabric itself, because I think a lot about like making my own clothes because I'm sick of what's out there, but am I just contributing to modern slavery in a different way when I do that? It's a great question. I don't have an answer to it, um, but if someone does, Jessica. Um, this, is, this is not a complete answer by any means. Um, there are more and more fabric brands, like, uh, sorry, not fabric brands, but like their mills, essentially, who are aiming to be more transparent about what where they're sourcing their original fibers from and then how the fabrics are made. Um, and so you'd have to almost go mill by mill. Um, that's where I think when you can get fabric secondhand is the best way to, to do that. Um, you're avoiding sort of like all of the harm of any virgin material, both in sourcing the actual fiber material itself and any damage that's done in a like social justice way along the chain of that creation of that fabric um, by keeping something in its life cycle for a longer period of time. Um, and so I know like, for example, there's sometimes a lot of concerns between leather and faux leather. Um, and I think that is really just, if you're going to use leather, use blood that already exists. Um, I think that's wh whatever exists is already going to be more beneficial, save you some time on research. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ashlyn. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I think that is sort of the next layer of the supply chain. So we've, you know, done a lot of research and citizens are asking a lot of questions of brands, but now it's sort of that next level of like people are understanding who like all of the layers of the supply chain. And so um, there, I know there are fabric companies that are starting to get asked those same questions. So like Spoonflower, for example, is starting to talk about sustainability and sustainability goes hand in hand with sustainable supply chains. So people being paid a living wage. And I think it's up to us to start going to that next level with with a company that you already love and trust for your fabrics if you're going to buy new and and challenge them to to be transparent and to show up and to start opening up about their supply chain because you care. I really appreciate what Jessica said that there are companies that are trying and and they're testing things out and maybe they have a line of fabrics that they're that they're testing with their supply chain but they're not talking about it and and by you just asking them um, that is encouraging that's changing the mindset and so we're not quite there yet but i do think there's um, ways to encourage uh, brands and businesses to do better one thing i'd just like to quickly add um, to what Ashlyn and Jessica said, I put it in the chat, but Stephanie, there's also recommend looking at open apparel registry um, in terms of it's, you know, a very robust 
search tool um, with the goal of making the supply chain more transparent across uh, major brands. You can actually look up um, where, you know, what factories across, you know, a global map they're utilizing. And, um, you know, I believe it is being monitored and looked at for human rights violations and um, more, you know, more of that social angle as well, if you want to do a, a deeper dive. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren, I'm going to keep you on the hook for a minute because there's a great question from uh, Alyssa asking about the extra work and the burden of pulling from stock and repurposing, gar repurposing garments. And I know that the Sustainable Production Toolkit really addresses that labor question and if you would answer it. Sure. Um, yeah, there is, there is definitely a labor component that comes to um, you know, putting the systems in place that we need to be more sustainable. So I think, you know, while there are individual actions we can all take, I think it's also worth um, kind of zooming out and looking at how, you know, the overall ecosystem and how, what kind of labor, what kind of um, additional support, whether that's um, financial overhire to get the, um, you know, both the time, the money and resources needed to achieve some of these, um, you know, sustainable goals. Um, and I think one of the things we're looking at too is just exploring the idea of time as a resource and um, how that can be um, utilized in a slightly different way, both from the standpoint of measuring impact, because I think, you know, just looking even at the example of a plastic bag versus a 100% cotton bag, I think someone said, you know, there's a huge amount of water that's used to create a 100% cotton bag. But if you're looking at the time scale of carbon footprint and impact in the short term, yes, cotton bag, um, you know, bigger footprint. But if you span that out over a lifetime, you know, it switches. So I think it's really worth, um, think, you know, thinking about time too as a, as a resource for how we measure and how we, um, successfully achieve some of these these goals. I, I want to I want to add on to that if that's okay. Um, one of the things that Maggie at the Chicago Green Theater and I, Alliance and I talk a lot about is that it's better to pay people than pay for stuff. Um, so if you are using stuff that's already in stock or finding something that is thrifted and so cheaper redirecting some of that money to labor to pay for overtime for your staff or pay for additional artisans to create things. I think that is always a better use of money is keeping it in our community. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right. We have time for one more question or two in the session and then we do our panel, much of our panel is able to stick around a little longer to answer some additional questions. So we've got some good ones in here. I want to thank you, Jessica, for addressing Bailey's question about faux leather and leather. Um, that was great. And Charlie, did you have a question? Uh, no, I just was, uh, you actually said what I was going to say, that we will uh, collect these resources and the STP has, uh, SPT has great resources on it. So, um, there's a lot out there and we will at the BGA and with the uh, toolkit collect these things so you can come here when those questions uh, occur. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. And I see a question here from Jill. Um, I'll read it. Uh, where can a theater recycle older or vintage furs that aren't really wearable anymore? All right. Well, then that is something we. I do see that someone commented that some pet shelters take them, and I think that there are also I've I've seen brands that will make them into like teddy bears or things like that. Um, so I think that there are organizations that do repurpose them, but I think that at a certain point a, a fur does sort of reach the end of its life because it is just deteriorated because it's a natural fiber and it deteriorates. Yay! <laughs> That's fantastic. All right, I am aware of the time, so I'm going to bring our, our formal session to a close here. And I see that there's a couple other questions. So if you have the time and want to stick around, again, our panel will be here to answer them. But I want to give a giant thank you to this extraordinary panel. 
Uh, thank you, Kristen, Lauren, Eileen, Ashlyn, Jessica, and Nan for joining us this afternoon and sharing your incredible wealth of knowledge. I know I learned a ton. I'm really excited to dig into these resources and we will be sending all of these things out and more uh, in a follow-up email you can look for tomorrow. And as Charlie said, you can continue to find us at broadwaygreen.com and on social where we will continue to share these tips and you can find the sustainable production toolkit at the link that Edward shared in the chat and we will share as well. Well. So again, a big thank you. We will be back with another Green Quarantine in December, on December 10th, where we'll have two extraordinary panelists uh, hosted by Laurel Harris of Jagged Little Pill. We have A.Y. Young, who is one of the 17 sustainable youth leaders in the world, joining us to talk about his uh, founding of Battery Tour. And we will have Megan Finn of the Tank Theater talking all about how to use renewable energy to power our shows. So not to miss and otherwise thank you all stick around if you have some more questions great all right so panel if you are able to stay um i don't know uh catalina are you still here do you want to ask i am question? great um so I've been working on a research project with my costume faculty mentor and we had the hardest time finding a fabric shredder and Jessica mentioned the shredding of fabric. Because um, what we're doing is we are documenting the composting of earthworms for fa costume fibers and then turning the waste from the earthworms into gardens that do sustainable dye plants or um, community gardens and things like that. But the problem is, is a lot of the shredders we were able to find are um, fa uh, paper or plastics and the kind of chunkiness we want is dual purpose because I'm also a hand spinner and there's a way to shred fabric to a point where it's back to its threads and you can spin it. And I was just wondering if she had any information on what, where I could even find that thing. <laughs> Um, this is probably the question I get asked the most. Um, we work with an industrial shredder located in New Jersey. Um, they are not keen on me sharing their information <laughs> publicly. So many people have asked for tours or like to understand um, more about their machinery. I will say though, they have a huge foot footprint. I mean, in terms of the space that their machine um, takes and we are by far their smallest client and we're taking about five to 10,000 pounds a month to the shredder. So for some smaller projects, it's really hard to find a place that will shred like 100 pounds, 200 pounds at a time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can understand um, the difficulty because it took months for us to find a shredder and it's still at this very, very industrial scale. I know there's a couple graduate programs that are working on fiberizers. I think that's from Cornell. Um, that is basically like ripping apart fabric back down to their like fiber and yarn levels. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have <laughs> more to share. That is like a very crucial missing piece of, I think, true textile recycling infrastructure. Okay, no, that's super helpful. Thank you. I just, uh, the only thing I could find was commercial and we needed, we wanted to build or have one in the shop. Right, yeah, everything. Like I said, we're sending five to 10,000 and we're definitely the smallest um, that's going. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to, to wave or, or click on and ask. Leave it open and yeah, Alyssa. So this is a little bit unrelated to what we've been talking to so far, but I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on how integrating technology into our shops can help with sustainability. And what I mean by that is um, things like digital pattern drafting or uh, using 3D scanning equipment to create mock-ups for actors to cut down on um, both the labor cost and, um, or the labor and uh, materials to make mock-ups or any ideas like that. Um. Well, uh, we actually use a lot of our older fabrics. We, we tend to recycle our old fabrics in, in stock um, to make those mock-ups. So 
Um, and then taking away or minimizing labor always kind of scares me because that's what we were all trained to do. And then that means we're out of a job and I now have to learn how to use a machine to do what I used to know how to do before. So um, not that I don't think that that's a worthwhile thing. Um, we use a lot of computer um, software in our costume shop to begin with so that we're not printing a lot of things. So we're actually kind of taking away that whole like paper aspect of it. Um, of course, we could not do zero printing, um, but we're doing less. So we're not using as much ink as we used to or as much paper. But um, I think if theaters go completely into technology, then we've lost the human element in that. Um, and I'm just speaking for myself, honestly. I, that just, it, that kind of, when you said it, it kind of scared me. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, I need a job. Um, but, but also knowing that any amount of material that we have in our shop is always reused, repurposed, retooled. We don't throw that away willy-nilly. Um, we definitely love the Green Alliance and we take our, our, our textiles to be recycled with them uh, or we take them to the Textile Recycle Center ourselves. Um, uh, so those fabrics to us are, are valuable to make those mock-ups. That's, that's how we use them. I really appreciate your insight and I didn't mean to scare you. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay. I'll, I'll um, add, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about was um, patterning, digital patterning you mentioned, and a friend of mine has been sending me um, projectable patterns, where you put a projector over your table and it projects the pattern instead of using a paper pattern. And I sort of have mixed feelings about that because I feel like you can, um, it's a little harder to finesse or to make last minute adjustments. Um, and I also sort of wonder about the energy footprint of the projector versus the brown undyed craft paper that I will then repurpose into other things. So I don't know if it's like a dream solution, but I know that there are some technology solutions that are out there that are very interesting and worth exploring. And I think one of the things that's important to know about that is we have to explore these technologies so we can gain parts of it to go forward that will be really helpful. I think the other thing we're not talking about is the difference between the budgets we're all talking about. So you may have a little theater that no way could you afford the technology to do that. Um, so we gotta have people that can still do it. Um, but you know, Goodman might be in the realm of having the money to do something like that, but still the point about hand doing it. So I think there's, we need both, but we have to keep them in balance for what we can afford. I would agree. I'll, I'll add, you know, the overall in the production world, and you can find this again on our website or in the SPT, we talk a lot about digital solutions for scripts, for the paperwork and things like that. And there's more and more apps and programs being developed, it seems, by the day, uh, especially as people look to COVID safety protocols and removing as much sharing of touchables as possible. So that's a really um, interesting avenue to go down. And, um, and what I love, I'm glad, Nan, you brought up the different budget sizes and what different people are able to access. And I think that's so important as one of the BGA principles is it's impossible to be green. You can only be greener. And that applies, you know, I've done work at, at big theaters and small theaters and what we're able to accomplish is very different. But the important thing is that in each of those places, we are striving we're to be greener. Trying. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really great. Yeah. An awesome question, man, awesome question. <laughs> it, it was cool to put it out there. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Jill. So um, I work at a medium-sized regional theater in California. And um, one thing my theater has sort of developed over my tenure of on and off for 30 years is um, creating alliances with smaller companies to like I mentioned in the chat, we sustain our large costume stock by doing the rentals to other theater companies and school theater programs and prorate the costs depending on the length and production and the type of organization. And that income pays for us to have a regular staff person to maintain the stock, keep it organized and all that. So it helps me by being able to go and find our stuff when we need it, because that's the number one place we pull our shows from. And it also helps the up and coming 
theater programs and smaller theaters and that don't have storage space so that they have somewhere to source their um, costumes from. And we have rummage sales every few years to when we call our stuff and we sort of give the smaller organizations and schools first crack at those um, things that we're getting rid of. And it's been very, very sort of mutually beneficial. Um, we benefit by having our stock really well organized and pieces getting used and the smaller organizations benefit by having access to all this nicer stuff that they wouldn't be able to afford. Um, so I think that helps the big picture of our sustainability and it allows us to reuse more. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there as a way to kind of connect with other companies to share the the greening, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, sharing networks are like my number one thing when it comes to sustainable costumes because it also increases access to designers that maybe wouldn't have it and creates better production values for everyone, which creates better shows, which creates better audiences. And it's just, I love sharing networks. Talk about it all day. <laughs> Of that. All right. I am aware of the time and that Zoom fatigue is real. So uh, unless there's any other burning questions, I think we will bring this to a close. Um, you can continue to reach out and engage. Uh, so the conversation does not have to end here, but our Zoom eyes will uh, take a break. So <laughs> with that, thank you all again. Thank you all for sticking around and sharing these great questions and thoughts. It's been a pleasure and we will speak again soon. Thanks, Molly. Bye, everyone. Thank you.